This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. Over uh, 450 years ago, a man by the name of John Calvin, who lived in the 15th, uh, in 1509 to 1564, a, a French theologian, began teaching uh, a system of theology that eventually became known as Calvinism. Today, believe it or not, millions and millions of people believe in Calvinism, things that John Calvin, who lived 450 years ago, taught. And this morning, I'm, I'm not going to deal with Calvinism specifically. I want to address an issue that's been made more difficult to teach from a biblical perspective because of Calvinism. I want to teach you some things about what the scriptures say about the Holy Spirit. And the reason I, I bring Calvin into this is because the concepts of the Holy Spirit that exist among so many people that I have contact with come from John Calvin's mind, not the Bible. And you know, if you've watched this program for the last 14 years or more, that I'm always trying to point people back to what the Scriptures say. Uh, you, you can read the Bible for yourself and understand what it says. Those who believe in what John Calvin taught teach that if a person is saved in a saved state, that God's spirit moves within them to determine what's right and what's wrong. That there's always this inner movement that reveals the truth to that person. That the Holy Spirit convicts Christians of sin so that they always know if a thing is right or approved of God. That if you just let the spirit work that you will be guided into all of the truth. And I want you to, to know Right up front as we begin this episode, the Bible teaches no such thing. I want you to think about what such a position would do to the Word of God. If you're a Christian and you no longer need to spend any time searching the Scriptures because the Spirit would guide you into all of the truth. Why, why would we have a verse like Acts 17, verse 11? Look at what it says. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. That's the Bereans who examined the scriptures daily to see if the things that were being taught and preached were so. Why would we need that reference? Why didn't the Bereans just allow the Holy Spirit that was in them to guide them into the truth so that they wouldn't make any mistake? If the Holy Spirit reveals directly to each person how he is to live, then why do we even study the Bible at all? Why would Paul write, as he did in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, be diligent to present yourself to prove to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth? Why would you be diligent? The King James Version says, study to present yourself approved to God. Why would you need to be diligent in your study of God's Word to be uh, so, so that you're not ashamed? What, how could you possibly be ashamed if the Spirit guides you into all of the truth? Why would we have the New Testament? Why did God even bother with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and, and, and the rest of the, uh, the apostles and prophets in the New Testament? Why did Paul write? If the Holy Spirit leads you into all of the truth by convicting us of sin 
and confirming the truth that's within us, why did Paul have to confront Peter? In Galatians, you, you good Bible students know that Peter made a mistake and Paul had, had to confront him to his face. What was wrong with the Holy Spirit that was in Peter, the inner moving of the Spirit to guide him into all of the truth? Now, this, this is very interesting because in the case of the apostles, they had the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth, but the Holy Spirit didn't reveal the truth to them on an individual level. Otherwise, Peter would never have made a mistake. Why did the Holy Spirit have to say through Paul, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. What, what would we need the scriptures for to reprove us? to correct us, to train us in righteousness. If the Holy Spirit moving within us couldn't do that. You see what that position does to God's Word? If the Word is unable to make us adequate, equipped for every good work, then the Bible contradicts itself. Then, then it's not right. If, if we've got to have that Spirit to make sure we do what's right, then, then why would Paul say, it's the scripture that does that. And what do you do when one person who's being moved by the Spirit believes an activity is right and another person who is being moved on the Spirit believes that it is wrong? If they feel that there's some inner confirmation, uh, confirmation, if they feel that there's an inner confirmation by the Spirit and this person doesn't feel that, who are you going to listen to? You see, there's all kinds of people making these claims. There's one that claims this and another that claims that and another that claims this and their conflicting views. Is God the author of confusion? 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33 says he is not. God is not the author of confusion. God doesn't inspire confusing and conflicting ideas. What God wants, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, is unity. And whose nudge of the Holy Spirit are you going to accept? The one that says this or the one that says that? You see, it becomes a selective, subjective process. You choose the subjective idea that you want to choose. But the Bible is objective. There is one source, just one source of truth. Solomon said in Proverbs 14 and verse 12 that there is a way that seems right to man and its end is the way of death. There is a way that may feel good, but it leads to destruction. And the only way that we can be sure that we have gone the right way is by consulting the Bible. Look at what Paul says in Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Paul is not ashamed of the gospel for it contains God's power for righteousness. And it leads to faith. Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. And Peter says there's just one standard. 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. The Scripture is more than adequate for informing us about sin and salvation and bringing us to spiritual maturity, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 says. 
and it's complete. And it will judge us in the last day. Hold on to that thought while we take you away for just a second for this free offer, and then we'll come back to this important study on the Holy Spirit. Watch this, please. Jesus said clearly, He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. Uh, Mark that down in your Bibles and underline that. It's the Word. Now, in previous episodes, we studied the significance of the Word of God in our spirituality and in our relationship to God. And we'll talk a little bit more in these episodes about the work of the Holy Spirit in, in producing the Word. But don't, don't overlook this verse. It's not someone's subjective nudging, well, God told me this, or God said that to me. That's not what's going to judge you. And if you listen to what somebody says in that regard, uh, you're placing yourself in a very vulnerable position because you have to believe that your salvation is going to be based upon what they say being right and correct. And there is another standard that the Bible says that we're going to be judged by. It's the Word of God that came through the Holy Spirit. The only way to know the will of God is by consulting His Word. That's it. That's the only way. It alone, the Scriptures tell us, makes us wise unto salvation. Romans 1.16, it's the power of God for salvation. So, as we begin to talk about the Holy Spirit, we're going to discuss it very objectively from what is revealed in the Scripture. Not in, sub, in the subjective thought processes and doctrines of men and concepts that men have come up with. And the best place to start is at the very beginning and just talk about who the Holy Spirit is. Who is the Holy Spirit as revealed in the Bible? Throughout the Bible, and especially in the New Testament, the personal pronouns, he, his, and him, are used to refer to the Holy Spirit, which suggests the personality of the Holy Spirit. I am aware of the fact that there is a, that the pronoun it is used in uh, 1 Peter 1 and verse 11, and occasionally you will find that, but, but by far, in the New Testament, he, his, and him are used to refer to the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, the traits and the personality of the Holy Spirit are revealed. For example, in Romans 8 and verse 26, let's read that together. The Holy Spirit has a mind. In the same way, the Spirit also helps with our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he, and he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we're going to come back to this uh, section of Scripture. In fact, we're, we're going to look at a, a lot of passages and make a point there without making all of the points there and then come back to the same passage to make another point in this series of lessons. But the point we want to make right here, right now, is that you, you understand from reading this passage that the Holy Spirit has a mind. It's not some impersonal force. The Holy Spirit has a mind that searches the mind of God and intercedes for us. And mind is evidence of personality. The Holy Spirit is a person, and the Holy Spirit may be grieved. Look at what Isaiah says, and Acts, or in Ephesians says. Isaiah 63, verse 10 says, But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned himself to become their enemy. He fought against them. Ephesians 4, and verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God 
by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Only a, a person may be grieved. You cannot grieve some impersonal force. And only a person may be blasphemed, as is recorded in Matthew chapter uh, 12 and verse 31. The Holy Spirit was blasphemed. Look at this. Therefore, I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Only a person can be blasphemed. You don't blaspheme inanimate objects. So. You don't blaspheme forces. You blaspheme persons, people. The Holy Spirit bears witness to certain things. John 15 and verse 26. When the Holy Spirit comes, whom I send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. You see, the Spirit testifies or witnesses Romans 8 and verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. All of these things then are personalities and traits of a person, an impersonal force or a cosmic force. Neither has mind nor can it be grieved. And since these things are true of the Holy Spirit, then we know that the Holy Spirit is a person. We'll talk more about that when we come back right after you watch this. In the New Testament, principally, the, the actions of the Holy Spirit as recorded uh, by the Bible writers show us the personality. For example, both, both Paul and Jesus say that the Holy Spirit speaks. Look at these passages. John 16, 13. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he speaks, whatever he hears, he, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. Uh, Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, uh, 1, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Uh, people speak, persons speak, inanimate objects, uh, forces, uh, animals do not, do not speak. The Holy Spirit speaks. And the Holy Spirit also reveals the mind of God. 1 Corinthians 2 and verses 10 and 11. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man who is, which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit reveals that mind. Ephesians 3 and verse 5 says, Which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles, prophets, and the spirit. The, the Holy Spirit that came to the apostles and prophets revealed God's mind because the Holy Spirit has mind, is mind. And the Holy Spirit gives direction to missionaries and mission trips. Acts 16 and verse 7 is an example uh, where the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them to go from one place to another. And we've already seen in Romans chapter 8 that the Holy Spirit intercedes. Look at Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps with our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, I promise you I'm going to come back to this very important beautiful passage of Scripture and discuss how all of that works uh, in, in a future episode. But here I want you to see this. The Holy Spirit intercedes. There's evidence of a personality, of a person there. Here is what we have seen from the Scriptures so far. The Holy Spirit has a mind. 
That's evidence of a person. The Holy Spirit may be grieved. That's evidence of a person. The Holy Spirit may be blasphemed. That's evidence of a person. The Holy Spirit bears witness or testifies. That's evidence of a person. The Holy Spirit speaks. That's evidence of a person. The Holy Spirit reveals the mind of God. That's evidence of a person. The Holy Spirit gives direction to missions. That's evidence of a person. The Holy Spirit intercedes for Christians. That's evidence of the person, of a person. So the Holy Spirit's teach us, the Holy Spirit or the scriptures teach us that, that the Holy Spirit is God. It's so important for us to see this. It's the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God. The last words that Jesus said to his disciples were these. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm going to come back and study this passage in detail next time we get together, but I want you to notice that the, the word name is singular, and yet there are three who wear it. Name is authority. If the Holy Spirit were not a person, he would not wear the name of the Father. And the three are one. The three are equal in power and authority. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. We'll come back to this subject next week on what do the scripture, scriptures say. Glad you tuned in. If we can help you in your Bible study, if we can send you one of our courses, please call or write to us. See you next week. Bye-bye. We thank you for your interest in What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that you will come back to scripturesay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.